And if you will, take your Bible with me and open it to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Last week, I addressed the subject of hats off to the past. Honoring the past, especially those who have had a part in our life, the founding fathers of our nation, and the uh, saints who have gone on before us, pastors, missionaries, Christian workers, parents, uh, any of our, uh, those who have gone on before us, honoring the past, those who have had a part in our life, we need to honor the past. Hats off to the past. But we need to go on to the future. So coats off to the future. So think about taking your coat off, rolling up your sleeves, and going to work. Now it's uh, important uh, for us to realize that uh, we can only do the things of the Lord or anything in life today. We can't do it tomorrow, but we need to have plans for tomorrow. We need to have a, a vision for the future. It's just like these uh, professional football teams. Uh, too many times they think we've got this game in the bag and they start looking forward to the next game and they get beat by somebody that's not supposed to be able to beat them. Uh, so we need to look at what's happening today and do the very best we can today and not let uh, what we're thinking about in the future interrupt our plans for getting things accomplished now because that's the only time we can live now. You can't rewrite the past and you can't rewrite the future. So why worry about it? Uh, live in the now, the, the present. So last Sunday we talked about things that are behind us which we should forget. And then we not uh, talk today about things ahead which we must strive to attain. Things ahead, the future, which we must strive to attain. The apostle speaks of three things for which he reached forth. Let's look here especially at verse uh, 12 and 13 and 14. If you'll follow along here in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. The Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Philippi and the, the theme of the epistle of Philippians is joy. Write that down. Keep that in mind. The theme for this epistle is joy. Having joy in Christ. Having joy in life. And in verse 12 he says, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The word press is where we get the word pressure. You know, we don't like to have pressure. We don't like to have stress. But did you know you can't live without some pressure, without some stress. There's a certain amount of stress that we must have in order to produce, in order to live. Yeah, you know, it's nice to be laid back. But if all you do is lay around and, and, and so on, you're never going to get anything done. Uh, part of life is having some stress. Now you can have too much, obviously, and many people have too much in this day and age with all the technology and the strains and stresses that they put on themselves. And we must learn to pick those things which we're going to give attention. Uh, somebody says, uh, pick your battles. You know, you can't do everything. So you have to decide, what are my priorities? And as the song was saying, many times people say, well, I don't have time for church. I don't have time for the Lord. The, the things that we need the most, that are going to help us the most, we rule out. But there has to be some pressure. So he said, Paul said, I'm going to press on. I'm going to stress. I'm going to strain. I'm going to strive and go on to the future. Now he talks about three things for which he reached forth. First of all, in your notes, we must press on to perfection. We must press on to perfection. And he talks about that in verse number 12 of Philippians 3. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, 
and that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul was a competitor. And that's part of uh, uh, the greatness of America is competition. Uh, you'll notice that businesses a lot of times want to locate close to another business of the same kind. And the reason is, if you have an office depot over there, little ways, and a staple over there, somebody goes to the office depot, they, they might not have found what they were looking for, and they know their staple down there, they'll go down there. So uh, competition's good. It's good in a lot of ways, and, and it's, in, it's certainly good in, uh, in uh, sports. Competition. It makes people do better. Uh, and so the Apostle Paul was a competitor. He talked about it in the race that he... He used the race as an illustration of that, uh, about winning a, a prize and so on. And the first part of verse 12 tells us about the word perfect. Either we're already perfect. Now the word perfect does not mean being sinlessly perfect or anything like that. It's just talking about being spiritually mature, perfect, complete. If you have it complete, you don't need anything else, you see. That's what marriage is about. A man finds a woman, the woman finds a man, they get married, and they're to meet each other's needs so they don't look around for someone else. It's to meet that need in their relationship. It fulfills their life, their relationship. And here it talks about being spiritually mature or complete, grown up in the Lord. Now, here the need for growth is implied, and as we look at Hebrews 6 and verse 1, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1, it says these words, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, he said, Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now, the writer of Hebrews is saying here to leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He does not mean to cast them aside, but he said leave them and build on them. You, you, you're not to be a, a babe in Christ forever. Leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Go from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. Build upon. He said not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead work. You can't get saved again. Once you're saved, once you receive Christ, God gives you eternal life. So you can't go back and lay that foundation again. Leave the, the uh, he said, leave the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Go on into perfection or completeness to maturity. God's people are to grow and become strong in the Lord. In order to grow, there are three things essential. One of them is to feed upon the word of God. Feed, let your mind feed on the word of God. Let your heart feed, nurture you. Feed upon the word of God. There are so many resources for that. Now that we have the internet and all that, you can listen to the word of God constantly. There, there's no excuse for God's people. We have resources at the back, daily, uh, the daily bread and so on that you can, can, can take with you and will help you to feed and grow upon the word of God. Don't, there's no excuse that's going to get you out of that. Every one of us. We have, the, we have the resources. So first of all, in order to grow, you must feed upon the word of God. In order to grow, we must regularly engage in prayer. That's what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray without ceasing. We're to always be in the attitude of prayer. We shouldn't have to get reacquainted with the Lord when it comes time to pray. We ought to be in, hooked in, connected already in prayer and, and go immediately to Him whenever there's a need arises. Regularly engage in prayer. Constantly. You can just breathe a prayer uh, even as you're driving. The car. Something comes to mind and you say, Lord, help me with this. Of course, you don't close your eyes. You say, Lord, help me with this. I need some help, Lord. Uh, and uh, you just say a simple prayer. You don't have to go into the whole rigmarole, so to speak, and, and, and so on in prayer. Just 
pray constantly, pray without ceasing. Then thirdly, in order to grow, we must have sufficient work to do in the Lord's vineyard. We must have sufficient work. How much are you doing for the Lord? How much are you serving the Lord? Where are you serving the Lord through the church or through uh, other ways? Uh, how much are you serving the Lord in your neighborhood by inviting people to church and witnessing to them and letting them know that you're there and that you'd, that you'd be glad to help if they have a problem or anything like that? We're all to be ministers. So we can minister at the school, young people. And wherever we are, we're to be ministers for the Lord. And thank God for the teachers we have in our church. They have a tremendous mission field, every one of these teachers, because they, they have young people that they're ministering to all the time. In some way, you, people notice your life. So you're ministering for the Lord at all times, you see. And so these are ways we can grow. Now, number two, not only must we press on to perfection, but we must press on to take hold of the, God's purpose for us, to take hold of God's purpose for us, okay? Press on, take hold of God's purpose. Like that saying that we heard from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. there, you don't have something to die for. You know, that's very important to find something that's worth dying for. It'll make a lot of difference in your life. Many of our soldiers have gone over and into other areas and given their lives, completely have died for the freedoms that we have in America. That's how much they love this country. And then so many of us take it for granted. Shame on us. There's been a terrible price paid for our freedoms and a terrible price paid for our spiritual freedom through the blood of Christ. We have eternal life through Him. So we must take hold of God's purpose in it. Now, we all have a gift of some kind, at least one gift, spiritual gift, every one of us. And that's what 301's about in our, uh, in our uh, uh, classes that Pastor John uh, brings. We all have at least one gift. Some of us have two or three. And there's a difference between a gift and a skill or an ability. A gift is something God gives us. That's why we call it gift. A skill is something you can develop and improve on it. Now, you can take a gift and, and of course, uh, sharpen it up a little bit, I believe, and, and develop it, but you can't manufacture a gift. It has to come from God. And when God gives you a gift, you won't be happy unless you're doing that, using that gift for His glory. So every one of us, we need to find what God's purpose is for us in our life. Now, I've been preaching for over 50 years. And, uh, you know, I, I've tried to do some other things early on. I tried to do some music and things like that and uh, sang on a country music show in Denver and, try, and ran from the Lord for a little while. But I found right, right away, I, I'm not going to be able to do anything else but do what God's called me to do. And so I... I, I've settled that once and for all. That's the only thing I, I'll really be happy doing what God has called me to do. That's true of every one of us. Oh, I'm not talking about you being called to be a preacher, but what God wants you to be, a good housewife, a, a good employee, a good student, a, a good uh, whatever you're doing. God wants you to do the very best, and you need to find God's purpose in your life. Look at what it says here in, in Romans 8, 28 through 30 in your Bible. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And as uh, you're looking at that, uh, we notice in verse 12 of our text, he said, But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Finding that purpose for God, of God in my life. Now look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That word all is Significant, isn't it? We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his what? Purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, election in the Bible is that he elected us to be his children. But predestination has to do with us being Conform to the image of his son. We're to be predestinated to be like Jesus. That's what we're predestinated to be. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And we're going to talk more about that 
in, in just a little bit. So this is God's purpose. Now, I think one of the best illustrations, I heard a preacher use this many years ago, and it always has stuck with me. He said, like the lady that gets out the recipe and, you know, the yeast, the sugar and all that, whatever goes into baking a cake and takes that and stirs it up, fixes it all, puts it in the oven, cooks it for however many minutes it takes, however long, and then they take it out. And if it's all done properly, she puts a little vanilla frosting on it. I like angel food myself. My grandmother always made angel food cake. <laughs> but put a little frosting on it, that hot cake, oh my. And then you cut that and put it to your mouth. It tastes so good. But if you wouldn't take that yeast by itself and eat it, would you? You wouldn't take any of those ingredients and eat it by itself. So the Lord says, or Paul says, that all things work together for good. Some of my experiences taste like yeast or something like that. You know, it doesn't taste very good. Other experiences, oh, it's great. It's just like eating that sugar. <laughs> Didn't, wasn't good for me, but I sure like the sugar. Uh, experiences are different individually, but when God puts them together and puts them in his oven, it comes out, nothing says loving like something from the oven. How about that? That cake tastes so good. All things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So the question is, have you discovered God's plan for your life and are you pressing on in it? In Acts 9 and verse 6, Paul asked a question that I want you to think about this and I hope that you're asking this question. He said in Acts 9 verse 6, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Can you say that with me? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? One more time. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Have you asked God that question today? We ought to always, every day, be asking God that question. What would you have me to do, Lord, today? Guide my footstep. Open and close the doors according to your will. And when Paul asked that question, the Lord had the answer for him, didn't he? And then thirdly, we must press on, and this is in your notes, we must press on with deep concern for the lost. This is compassion. Deep concern for the lost, to win the lost. Deep concern to win the lost. That's the exact answer on that blank. We must press on with deep concern to win the lost. In other words, not just feel sorry for them and have compassion for them that way, but enough compassion to do something about it. To win the lost. To pray for them. To witness to them. Take a gospel track to them. Send an email to them. However you can witness to them, share the gospel with them. And this surely should be our attitude to those mentioned in verses 18 and 19 of Philippians 3 where it says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. That's a picture of the society today in the United States of America. Our culture has become so corrupt that this is an apt description of it whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. The Apostle Paul had a deep concern to win the lost all around him. And as we hurry on to the time of the Lord's coming, which will mean glory for us and gloom for the lost. Think of it, when Christ comes, it'll be glory for us. Oh, that will be glory for me. Glory for me. That will be glory for me, but it'll be gloom for the lost because they'll be left behind. And when we wait for that time, we should be burdened to win people to Christ. In 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12, uh, we'll be referring to this verse 12 twice. So if you want to look that up, 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12, it's a tremendous portion of Scripture. The Apostle Paul writes a lot of the New Testament, but also Peter 
had, a, had his hand in it as the Holy Spirit inspired him. And here in 2 Peter 3, verses 11 and 12, it says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The word conversation here means behavior, in the way you behave, the way you conduct yourself. In verse 12, he says, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Now I get to listen to the Grand Ole Opry once in a while on uh, Sirius XM radio, and the other night I was listening, and uh, John Conley, who, by the way, was an undertaker before he went into <laughs> country music, uh, but he, he was singing, and then he, and then he introduced one of his guests on the Grand Ole Opry, his segment, and it was George Hamilton IV. And uh, George Hamilton IV and the fifth, his son. Now, they sang together, and uh, uh, John Conley said, yes, and George uh, is a great ambassador for country music, and he's called that. He goes around, around the world uh, a uh, ambassador for country music, but he said he's also an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And boy, that people just started clapping their hands there at that, that, I think it was in the Ryman Auditorium. They used two different places uh, for venues there. But uh, they gave a big applause, and I thought that was great. People need to be recognized when they're an ambassador for Jesus Christ and not ashamed of it. Thank God for people like that. So i take my hat off if I had one on <laughs> to George Hamilton IV, uh, a tremendous Christian man there. And then... Uh, and it made me think good of John Conley, too, that he even introduced him that way. Uh, it kind of made me think, he's probably a Christian, too. It makes me happy about that. What an urgent need there is today to evangelize, to win the lost to Christ. Now, let's go on to the third main point. Uh, why are we to do this one thing? And by the way, uh, it's hard to do more than one thing really, really well. Now, you know, Peyton Manning... He does what he does really well. And uh, he's like a coach out there. Uh, and I noticed that his reaction's different than many of the other quarterbacks and players. When he might throw an interception or something, he'll go around, his head will be down and say, man, what, you know. But he doesn't throw a big temper tantrum like a lot of the players do. He goes over the sideline and they'll show him, he gets his notes out and starts working on things again. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm really impressed by his work ethic, you know. Uh, and... Uh, by the way he maintains his emotions. But you can't do more than one thing at a time and do it really well. And he does what he does really well. And there are many people in our lives that we can say that about, that they do that one thing very well. Now, we've got to have other interests for outlets, you know, like hobbies. But don't let your hobby become a main thing. This one thing, which consists of forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. That's one thing that Paul did. He forgot what was behind. He stressed and pressed toward what was ahead. Now, why should we do that? Number one, because we are citizens of heaven. <laughs> Did you know that? You and I, we're not aliens. As a child of God, we're not an alien. We are a citizen of heaven. Heaven is our home. I'm just passing through here. I don't want to drive my stakes down too deeply, so I'm not staying here long. Heaven's my home. I'm a citizen. In Luke 10 and verse 20, it says, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Glory to God. That makes me happy. If that won't cause you to get happy, then your wood's wet. I mean, I mean to tell you, put a match to that, it ought to light right up. Glory to God. My name is in heaven. Written in heaven. Many who are members of God's family are already there. I know many of them that are there. A lot, you know, when I started out, I didn't know that many. But I sure do now. So many that are in heaven right now. In Ephesians 3 and verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. The whole family of God in heaven and on earth were named after the Lord Jesus. We're called Christians, believers. 
And then secondly, as we think about this, because the Lord is coming to take us home. The Lord is coming. That's why we need to do this one thing as the Apostle Paul did, because the Lord is coming to take us home, and this is a great incentive for holy living. 1 John 1, 3, the Bible says, Behold, what manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us, and we should be called the children of God. Isn't that great that we are called the children of God? Now, the name Christian is wonderful, and they were called Christians first in Antioch, Acts, I believe it's 1026, uh, where they were called Christians first. But uh, I like the name believer, because a lot of people call Christians today that they have no idea what it means to be a believer, to be a born-again believer. They think, I'm a Christian because I was born in a Christian home, or I'm a Christian because I was baptized one time, or I'm a Christian because, and they used to even say, I'm born in a Christian nation. Until our president said we're not anymore, I guess. I, I mean, let me tell you something. I'm a Christian because I've received Christ, and I'm a born-again believer. I'm a child of God. That makes it real specific, doesn't it? So everybody knows what I am. I'm a child of God. We should be called the children of God. And then to patient endurance, according to Romans 8, 25, the Lord is coming to take us home. It's an incentive for holy living. Uh, and then uh, it says in uh, Romans 8, 25, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we have patience, wait, with patience, pardon me, wait for it. We need to have patience. And that's one of those things that I continue to work on all the time. I think I am you know, have grown some of that, but I, I, I still need more patience. A lot of times we get anxious and want things... Uh, things to happen now. And then thirdly, another reason why we need to do this is because we shall exchange these old bodies for new ones. I'm for that. Exchange these old bodies for new ones. Are you ready for a new one? I think some of us are getting close to being ready, don't you? I hurt in places that I didn't even know was there before. <laughs> I mean to tell you, uh, like that old country song, I feel better all over more than anywhere else. That's, that's the way it's going to be when the Lord comes. I mean, I'm going to feel better all over because he's going to give me a new body. And it says in verse 21 of our text that we'll have a body just like his body. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23, and I use these almost every uh, funeral service that I do, go out to the graveside, and, and I use these verses. It says, But now is Christ, Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And then in verse 23, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. See, Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of my resurrection. One day, I'll be resurrected. Either when I'm, I'll be alive and my body will be changed and caught up to be with the Lord, or if I've died, if, you know, the undertaker instead of the upper taker comes first. I, I mean, the Lord will just take me out of the ground and change my body like unto His. Instantly. Boy, that'll be something. Uh, these are exciting things to know. And then number four, another reason, because the prize day is coming. The prize day is coming. We press on. We have pressure when I was in high school and played uh, basketball, and played some in college too, but uh, mostly in, in high school, we had uh, what we call the full court press. And I'm, I know most of us know what we talk about there. That really puts stress on the team. Because uh, then you start guarding them the entire length of the court. I don't know if they even do that anymore in, in, you know, in the pros anyway, but we used to do that a lot in our defense. And uh, we'd be behind and we'd, and we'd say, well, let's have full court press. The coach would call it. And uh, sometimes you'd steal the, the other team as they uh, pass the ball in, steal it, and there you'd be right under the basket, put it in the basket. And you could rattle the other team if you were good at that, the full court press. Sometimes we need to have a full court press in our life. The apostle said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. 
Verse 14 tells us this. It reminds us that we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's for the believer. Those of us who are believers, who are Christians, born-again believers. The Bible says in Romans 14, 12, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, 1 Corinthians 3. I want us to read these uh, four verses. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15. And uh, as we think about this, in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, it talks about the Bema seat, of the judgment seat of Christ, where Christians will be judged, where we will be, we will be judged. The judgment for the lost, those who have rejected Christ, is the great white throne judgment, where they'll be cast into the lake of fire. But here's where the believers will be judged. 1 Corinthians 3, 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. One day our works will be tried by fire. If they are made out of the wood hand stubble, they'll burn up, and that's it. But if it's gold, silver, and precious stone, they'll, it, won't, it won't burn up, and we'll receive a reward in heaven because of our work for the Lord. Now let's go on. Another reason why he's talked about this one thing. He said, because glory is coming. Number five, because glory is coming. He said in verse 21, we'll read that one more time, who shall change, this is in Philippians 3, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. See, glorious coming. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now think about the future with me. The future is as bright as the promises of God. Think about that. The future is as bright as the promises of God. The nicest thing about the future is that it always starts tomorrow. <laughs> Don't worry about it now because it starts tomorrow. Fear not tomorrow. God is already there. The God that's with me today will be with me tomorrow into the future. Ira Stanfield, a great uh, preacher and songwriter, one of the greatest songwriters, I think, of the last century, he pastored, I believe it was an Assembly of God church down in uh, Texas. He wrote many great songs. Mansion Over the Hilltop, I think, is probably the most familiar. Elvis sang it. A lot of people sang it. But he also wrote, I Don't Know About Tomorrow. Leanne Rimes uh, does this song in many, many quartets, different ones. I Don't Know About Tomorrow. It says, I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine because the skies may turn to gray. I don't worry about the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I'll walk beside him, for he's the one who knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Each step is getting brighter as the golden stairs I climb. Every burden getting lighter, and the clouds are silver lined. The sun is always shining and no tears will dim the eye at the ending of the rainbow where the mountains touch the sky. Many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Do you know him? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we pause and come into your presence, we come so with purpose, Lord. We come to ask. We come to praise. We come, Lord, because we need you. Lord, we ask that your will would be done in every life here today. Help us, God, to not worry about the future, but help us to trust the one who holds the future for us. Help us, Lord, to trust you in all things. For we ask it in Christ's name. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, are there those that would say, Pastor, pray with me that God will give me confidence into the future, that I won't worry about it, but that I'll trust God 
in my life now and into the future. Just pray with me about that. Amen. Just raise your hand if God has spoken to your heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Certainly we need to pray one for another. Anxiety can cause health problems when we worry about the future. I don't know about tomorrow, but I sure know the one who holds tomorrow. Yes. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask now that thy Holy Spirit would search our hearts and our lives. Help us to give you all the honor and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.